Right, so we are, if you want to take notes, page 75, but we are going to be looking at Genesis 1, 26 through 2, 3, so if you want to either open your Bibles up to that or else, we do have that scripture written out for you on page 62 of our, uh, in our workbook. So, yeah, so we're going to be looking at the image of God tonight, and we're going to talk about how that transforms the way we think about our worth and our purpose and our rest and how we find our rest in him. And when I was 15, I grew up in the church, and so I kind of, you know, heard this phrase, we're made in the image of God, but I don't think I quite, I I know I didn't quite understand what it meant. Because I remember when I was 15 and I had my first job interview, and they asked me a question at my job interview that I think I've been asked at every single other job interview that I've ever had. And it's my most dreaded question because it makes me instantly feel like I'm just not enough. And the question is, what are your hobbies? And I want to say, is talking a hobby? Because I don't have any hobbies, right? Like, I'm just like, I, I never really had any hobbies, and I'm not this, like, girly girl. I'm not really into the hair or the makeup or, you know, what's in style. I don't know. I'm five years behind. And, you know, I'm not really, like, this sporty girl. And I, I don't know. You know, they're, we're watching football. I'm like, who's winning the match? Like, I, I don't know. You know, I don't know what's going on. Um, so I'm just kind of like, I don't really fit in. I'm just this kind of boring, plain Jane person. There's really nothing special about me. And, and so I, I felt like that for quite a while, for a pretty big part of my life so far. And, you know, feeling like that, especially in your teen years, it really caused me to try to fit in, caused me to strive, caused me to, you know, try and prove where I was, what I, that I was worth something and left me looking for purpose in all the wrong places and off ultimately just I felt restless a lot of the time, restless. And I think many of us can feel that way. Sometimes we feel like we don't quite fit in. You know, we're kind of thinking, what's, what's my purpose? And we might look for value and purpose from people or, or jobs, the world around us. We might struggle with feeling restless. We're going to talk about rest tonight a little bit. And But see, knowing that we're made in the image of God and then living from this truth, it enables us to find our worth, our purpose, and our rest in Christ. And so we are made in the image of God. What we're going to talk about tonight is that we're made in the image of God to reflect his character and to represent him here on this earth. And we're going to talk about how we reflect and represent him in our worth, in our purpose, and in our rest. So we're going to dig into Genesis 1, 26. And it says, so this is after we had the six days of creation, and then on the sixth day, so then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, the wild animals, the creatures, I'm going fast here. And then oh, verse 27, it's so cool. This is actually the first poem in Scripture. So if we had this in our Bibles, it would probably say, so God created mankind in his own image. And then next line, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So it's our first poem in Scripture. Just something free for you there. But when, when we read this, when we read this, what we notice is there's a breaking. We talked about this in our homework. There's a breaking in the literary pattern because all before this, from Genesis 1, 3 through 25, God would say, let there be, let there be, let there be light, let there be, you know, sun, all that, let there be. And now it says, let us make. And so this is intentional. And I had a professor who would always say, the author is doing something with what the author is saying. The words that are used, the way it is written, it's very, very intentional. So for us as Bible study people, students, we want to like dig in and notice those things. So we notice there's the let us versus let there be. So let us, it's more personal. And this plural language of us refers to the triune nature of the one true God. And so because we are created in the image of the triune God, we are created for relationship with him. We're also created to be in relationship with others because he is a trinity, so he is in relationship with others as well. So our greatest purpose on this earth is to be in a relationship with our triune God. 
So our worth, it comes from who we belong to. It doesn't come from what we do. It comes from who we belong to. And we talked about that in the first week in the introduction, that, that dwelling, that God creates a people for himself to dwell with. And apart from a relationship with our triune God, we are spiritually dead. We're spiritually dead, and we are created by him and for him. So that's the first thing that we notice there is that let us. And then the second thing we notice is it says, in our likeness, versus before that, when it was talking about the animals, it said, according to their likeness. So in verse like 24, 25, it says, let us make the birds according to their likeness, according to their likeness. Now this is in our likeness. So we see here, mankind is set apart from all other creation. And then, in verse 31, we'll get there, but in verse 31, after God creates everything in humanity, then it says, and he saw what he made, and it was very good. But before that, it was good. It was good, it was good, it was good. Bam, humanity's created mankind, very good. So we are the pinnacle of God's creation. We're the pinnacle of God's creation. And I was just reminded of our definitions that we did dynasty. We talked about these week one, and we wrote, the crowning achievement of God's creation is a people that will reign and rule with God as his representatives on earth. And that's exactly why we're created in his image. It is to reign and rule with him as his representatives on earth. And because we are created in the image of God, When God looks at you, he sees a reflection of himself. Now that's pretty cool. When God looks at you, he sees a reflection of himself. So so if you wouldn't if you wouldn't look in the mirror and say ugly about God, if you wouldn't look in the mirror and say worthless about God, then you can't say it about you. Right? You can't say it about you. You're not worthless. You're created in the image of God. That brings you worth. But sin, sin does distort the image. It does distort the image. We still had the image, but sin distorts it. But Jesus Christ came to restore the image of God within us. So we can understand, and in hindsight, the revelation of Jesus Christ, we can see that the triune God created man in his image, knowing that one day the Son of God would become human. So we're created in the image of God, knowing that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, would become a human. And Jesus Christ, he lived out the image perfectly. He was and he is the only human who ever lived out the human life perfectly. And so the more we become like Christ, the more fully human we become. The more we become like him, the more human we become. That's what we're created for. And understanding our union with Christ, you guys know I talk about union with Christ a lot because it's transformed my life, but it's so key to this truth because we can not only understand our worth, but we can also see that we have all we need to carry out our purpose of reflecting the king. So those words, in Christ, they're in the New Testament, I think it's like 70-something times. Like, you are chosen in Christ, you are beloved in Christ, it's in Christ, like all this stuff, in Christ. And it's kind of like, what, what does that really mean to be in Christ? I know what it means to follow Christ, for Christ to lead me, but what does it mean to be in Christ? I heard this really great analogy that I wanted to share with you. And so they were talking about an airplane. So let's say an airplane is going to Hawaii. Like, can we go to Hawaii right now, right? We would love that. So if there's an airplane going to Hawaii, the relationship that we need to have to the airplane to get to Hawaii is we need to be in the airplane. So if the airplane gets to Hawaii, if I'm in the airplane, well, then I'm getting to Hawaii. So the question is not, did I get to Hawaii? The question is, did the airplane get to Hawaii? What happens to the airplane happens to me because I'm in the airplane. So if we talk about the fact that we're in Christ, what happens to Christ happens to us because we're in Christ. So the word said that he was 
crucified, that his, that his body was crucified. It says our bodies are crucified. So our old self is gone. Our old nature is gone. It says that he's been a new creation. So we are new creations because we're in Christ. It says that he's seated in heavenly places. So we are seated in heavenly places because we're in Christ. Because we're in Christ, we're chosen. We're worthy. We're accepted. We're the beloved of the emperor of the universe. All of this because we are united to Christ. Because we are in Christ, the Father sees us legally as perfect, holy, worthy, loved. And because we're united to him, we also have the power to walk it out to become holy and perfect. Maybe never perfect, but we'll step, we'll keep working towards it, right? And we have to know this is true. We got to know this is true because if we don't, every time we sin, we feel so defeated, We're going to think that's who we are. We're going to define our worth on our snap at our kids in the morning or our, you know, drive, uh, road rage, that's the word, road rage. You know, that word that maybe comes out that we didn't want to come out. We're going to make that be our identity. But our identity is in Christ. We're made in God's image and he restored the image of God in us. So we're chosen, we're worthy, we're accepted. And we reflect him, we reflect our triune God, as we live out this worth. We want to live out that worth. We shouldn't be walking around all depressed and woe is me, I'm just a sinner and all that. No, we should be confident. Our successes don't define us, hallelujah. Our failures don't define us. What defines us is who we belong to. So we should reflect that worth. We should have a God confidence about us as we're out in the community. We should be confident because we're made in the image of God. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Our God chose to come here and dwell with us. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And even though we sin daily, we're not called sinners. We're called saints. We're saints even though we sin daily, right? We're defined by what Christ has done. So we need to reflect that in our lives we don't have to beat ourselves up every single time we, we fall. It's been covered. We're secure. Do you have something in your past that just makes you cringe? That you just think, if only they knew that. Oh, I do. I got stuff like that that just brings shame. But see, that's been redeemed. That's been redeemed. Oh. Do you, did, you, did you mess up yesterday, today? You know, you just maybe go back into that sin pattern or go back into that addiction. Goodness, we have the Holy Spirit within us. He enables us to keep going. And see, all, all that junk in our past, all of a sudden it becomes a weapon against the enemy and it becomes a testimony of the goodness of God and what he has done. So we have to live into that worth. But see, the lies of this world, they are really, really loud. And the world is constantly telling you, you, you are what you do. You're, that's where your worth is found. It's found in how you look. It's found in where you live. It's found in how your children behave, the degree that you have. So we have to be so intentional to like the poles of this world. And I was just at Great Wolf. Uh, Great Wolf Lodge. Just, I literally just got home a few hours ago. I was in the water slides this morning. It was fun. So I was just there, and I'm in the Lazy River last night. And I'm going down the Lazy River, and I'm in the tube. And I found if I didn't, like, you know, do my own little swimming thing, that that current was going to bring me right under those waterfalls. And I was going to get drenched by that water. I didn't really want to get drenched by the water. But see, that's what happens in this world. If we're not intentional, if we're not intentional to like swim away from stuff, then all of a sudden we're going to find that we're being pulled away from the truth of who we are in Christ. And then that we also have an enemy. See, my poor mom, she's 71 and she came with us and she had two little five-year-old grandkids just pushing her right under. You know, they're just like, here you go, grandma, you know? So not only do we have the world pulling us into these, we also have an enemy who's just pushing us and telling us lie after lie after lie. So we have to be so intentional. And so I was thinking a little bit about habits and see, our habits... Our habits form us more than we form them. 
And the reason they're called habits is because we do them without even thinking. And so I found that I had some really bad habits related to this thing, this thing, and they were breeding anxiety, it was breeding legalism, the idea that I am what I do, that my performance matters, because if I'm constantly checking emails, what am I really breeding here? What am I thinking in my head? I'm thinking, well, what I do really matters, and you know, things can't go on without me, and I've got to you know, perform, I've got to do enough. If I'm constantly checking social media, then I'm feeling like, oh, I'm not really enough here, or you know, oh, I got this many likes, so you know, now I'm feeling better. My identity is how many people like me, and, and all of that. And it's like, it's, it's just so subtle that you don't really quite notice it. But it's just kind of reinforcing these lies that your worth is based on something else. It's based on your, your work. It's based on what people think about you and all of that. So what I'm trying to do here is, is get some, some new habits, right? Some, some new habits. One is uh, that I've been doing for, for a while, scripture before phone. I just try to always do that in the morning, scripture before phone, because I want to reinforce the truth of what God says, I want to reinforce the truth that I'm united with him, that I'm chosen, that I'm accepted, that I'm his, that my worth comes from him. I want to reinforce the truth that even though this world might look crazy, that God is in control and he's bringing ultimate justice. I want to reinforce that truth before I'm watching the news all day long. Oh, goodness. Um, Another thing I do is I just try to turn off my phone in the evening. You know, just turn it off because what what am I saying if I'm just saying, well, I got to be available, I got to be available. Like, it's just... I'm just like reinforcing this idea that I'm just so important. You know, I want to be intentional with my children. Well, we want to reinforce the truth that God is who God says he is and not reinforce these these lies that are constantly coming at us from the world. So I just, I'm asking you, consider your habits this week. Just try to think about your habits. Are, Are they helping us grow in our love of Christ I'm not just talking about our phones, you know, news things, whatever it is. Just ask the Holy Spirit to show you. He'll show you. He's so good. Are these habits helping me grow in love of God and love of neighbor? Because that's what we're here to do, to love God and love our neighbor. So just ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Ask him, say, are there areas in my life that are reinforcing legalism and this idea that I have to perform? Are they reinforcing anxiety in my life? And then say, how how can you help me by your spirit show me what new habits that I can embrace, that I can work towards, that will help me to grow in the fact that you, that I am who you say you are and just to live from the worth that we have in Christ. And so often we look for worth in our purpose. So we talked about how we reflect him in our worth, and now I want to talk about how we reflect him in our purpose. See, we think that we can find worth in our positions at work or in what we do, being a mom, but our purpose is really found as we reflect the character of God. So when we hear that term, made in the image of God, when the Israelites heard that term, it's one interesting thing they would have heard. They would have thought of an idol, an idol, because an idol in that culture was a representative of a god. So an idol was an image of a god. So in Exodus, God tells the Israelites not to make idols. Because one, God is so beyond our understanding, so amazing that any image that we make of God will not do. But two, he's already made images in his people. He's already made images in his people. And you're going to learn next week that the Garden of Eden was really the temple and that really ultimately the whole world is meant to be the temple of God. And when God built the temple, the Israelites, when they had that temple, there wasn't an image, there wasn't an idol in the Holy of Holies. Every other temple in that culture had an idol. But there was no idol in that temple. Why? One, we can't can't make an image of God. But two, he's already made images in his people, in his people. So, so no, we're, we're not supposed to be worshiping one another, but we are to represent God with the image that he's given us. We are representatives of the one true God. The image represents the presence and rule of the king. So us made in his image, we represent, or we're supposed to represent the presence and rule of the king. 
So if we can look back at verse 26, where it says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And then there's that, so that. I know, like, no grammar. But so that I know is a conjunction. I have learned one thing about grammar. It's a conjunction. And conjunction means purpose. Purpose. So there is a purpose here. Why are we made in the image of God? So that they may rule over the fish, the sea, the birds, the creatures. So what is God's purpose in creating mankind? It's rulership. It's for us to reign and rule under him. We are created to reign and rule under him. As we do that, we represent him and we make him known. And then we're following him and we're walking in our purpose as we do that. So our purpose is found as we reflect the king. And then all the other things that maybe we're wondering, am I called to this, am I called to that? I shared in in the Thursday morning, you know, I always used to wonder, what's my purpose, what's my purpose? But then you just learn, I'm just going to follow God, I'm going to know him and make him known. And I remember reading, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, that like 80% of all people want to write a book. And I thought, well, not me. Not me. I don't want to write a book. You know, I'm, I'm never going to write anything ever. And now I'm writing, I'm writing stuff, you know. So it's just, you just follow God and you just serve him. And he's going to show you those, those, you know, unique purposes that we all have. But our ultimate purpose that we all have is to follow him and reign and rule under him. So as we're doing that, he'll show you and he'll highlight exactly the unique places that he calls you But we're not going to find ultimate purpose in our giftings or our positions at work or our talents or our friends or our status. Our purpose is found in Christ. And like I said, the more we become like Christ, the more we become human. That's what we're created for. That's becoming more and more like who he created us to be. So God creates mankind in his image to rule and reign. And then in verse 28, it says... God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it. Rule over the fish in the seas, the birds in the sky, every living creature. So I want to highlight a couple things from this passage. One, notice it says God blessed them. And that's God's intention. I'm going to talk about this more in a couple weeks. But God's intention is to bless all of humanity. So God blessed them. And then God tells them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And then in verse 29, it says, Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, every tree that has fruit with seed in it. I'm going to summarize here. He gives them, you know, everything that has the breath of life in it. And it was so. And God said all he had made, and there it is, and it was very good. And then there was evening and morning, the sixth day. So I want to highlight, God tells them what to do. He gives them a command, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. And then he gives them every seed bearing fruit, every tree. And when God calls us to something, he gives us what we need to accomplish it. When he calls us to something, he gives us what we need. And so he called them to subdue, to fill the earth, and then he gave them what they needed. He provided for them. And when he calls us to reflect his character, He gives us his Holy Spirit to do it. He provides all that we need to do to reflect his character. And we talked about that word subdue in our homework. We talked about how it means to conquer evil. And then we went on and we talked about how Jesus conquered evil. So he did it by laying down his life, by surrendering to the will of the Father. And ultimately, he did it by the cross. Colossians 2.15 it says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. By the cross, the most upside down way, Jesus defeated the enemy, and he calls us to do the same. He calls us to do the same. In Mark 8 34, then he called to the crowd his disciples, and he says, and we've all heard this, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. (laughs) But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. 
So if we desire to rule and reign under our great king, which is what we're created for, which is where we're going to find ultimate joy and peace, so if we desire to do that, if we desire to subdue evil, then we must lay down our lives for the sake of others. We must deny ourselves. Deny having to be right all the time. Deny a desire to look a certain way. Deny getting our ways. And then we get to love others, pray for them, and put them first above our own needs. My husband has this saying. He says, love, serve, give, and forgive. Expect nothing in return. Love, serve, give, forgive. Expect nothing in return. That is the way of the cross. And that is what we are called to do. That is how we rule and reign with Christ under our King. And when we do this, we find life. See, our God is a trinity. He is a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who constantly self lives self-sacrificially for the sake of the other. See, Jesus prayed, not my will, but your will. I don't think that was like the first time he said that, right? Not my will, but your will, Father. The Father exalts the Son. The Spirit glorifies the Son, obeys the Father. They constantly live in sacrificial love for the other. That's what our triune God does. So we, made in the image of our triune God, who constantly lays down what might be in his own best interest for the interest of the other, we are created to live the same way. And because God is equally and eternally three persons who live in self-giving love and have always lived in self-giving love, God cannot be selfish. God has never been selfish. It is in God's nature to seek the good of the other. And he has put his nature within us to seek the good of the other. And when Jesus says in, in Mark, where we read there, when he says we're going to find our life if we lose it. He's not saying like in the next age, like, you know, in the afterlife, you're going to have really great rewards and everything's going to be great. He's saying here, today, now, you're going to find your life when you lose it. You're going to find your life. You're going to find joy and abundance. We thrive when we imitate our triune God. Our happiest days are the days that we just pour out our lives for others. And we know this to be true. It's just, it's just in us. A couple of weeks ago, my little Emmett, five years old, is like, it's Friday. Okay, so I'm mom of three kids. By the time Friday comes, it's like we're ordering pizza and we're watching a movie. And it's not because I'm fun. It's because I'm tired. Okay? And... I, I don't know what it was, but Emmett is like, I'm waiting for my husband to get home, and he's just like, can you play the cheetah game with me? And I'm like, what's the cheetah game? You know, where we crawl around, and we go like this, and like, you know, and, and we attack each other with our fake claws. And I'm like, I don't want to play no cheetah game right now. Like, I want some popcorn. I am so tired. And then I was thinking of this message. I was like, oh, I'm Mm, supposed to live self-sacrificially for the benefit of another, right? I'm like, okay, Emmett, mommy will play the cheetah game with you. So, you know, I crawled around on the floor and pretended to be a cheetah. And, you know, and we had, we had, I had a really, really great time. But if you have a five-year-old, my third child is very bored. And so you can bring them over and we can have a play date because um, he needs some friends besides mama. But, <laughs> but you guys see, we, we aren't created to live for ourselves. We're, we're created to lay down our lives and to serve one another. So I want to ask you, how can you set aside your own needs to serve? And who is God calling you to serve? Who's he calling you to serve? Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's a friend, your kids, neighbor, Maybe just going the extra mile at work. It doesn't have to be some, some big thing. Just in our everyday lives, how can we serve? How can we lay down our lives for the sake of another? It's what we're created to do, and it's how we bring the kingdom. It's our purpose. And when we do that, it's how that selfishness is just rooted out of us. And it's how we rule and reign under our great king. 
And you know, we can't do that without Christ. We can't do that without Christ, okay? I can't even play a cheetah game without Christ, right? Like we cannot do it without him, but he has put his spirit within us. He has supplied all that we need to lay down our lives for the sake of the other. So to be made in the image of God, oh, man, we are created to reflect him in our purpose. And that purpose is to rule and reign under God by living like Jesus, by laying down our lives. That's the kind of rulership that Jesus came to this earth, and we are called to live in the same exact way. So I want to highlight one more thing about being created in the image of God. So we're going to reflect him in our worth, knowing who we are, reflecting him in our purpose and how we live. And lastly, I want to talk about how we reflect him in our rest. Now, I could... I could talk a lot about rest, so this is just very, very minimal. I was thinking we should do a whole six-week study on rest, but this is just minimal. But see, the truth is if we don't find our worth and our purpose in him, then we're never going to have true rest. And in Genesis 2, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, and on the seventh day, he rested from all his work then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So God rested on the seventh day. Now God does not need rest, but he ceased working and he set up a pattern for his people to rest. And I think it's important for us to consider that and to consider if we are taking time to rest and I was talking with my sister on my way home from the water park, and, and we were saying how really it is just the epitome of self-sufficiency when we refuse to take a rest, when we refuse to step away from the phones or from the work. So let's be women who, who rest, who take that rest. But there's, there's, see, there's, there's something else here that I want to talk about because there's a literary pattern that was broken on this day as well. See, there's... There's no morning and evening, or there was no evening and morning the seventh day. It's missing an ending. And that points to the eternal rest, to the eternal wholeness and the healing that we will all receive in new creation, in the fullness of the kingdom of God. But see, we're, remember, we're in the already not yet kingdom, so we can receive this rest today. Maybe not fully as it will be when Jesus returns, but we can receive this rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. He will give us rest for our souls, rest for our situations, rest from our anxiety and just our busy minds. See, we shouldn't look like the world. We shouldn't be all worried, fretting around, right? We, we know how this is ending. We know who's in control. We should, we should have rest even amidst the crazy. We should have a rest and a calming sense about us. But because we're in that already not yet kingdom, it's so easy to be pulled into the ways of this world, easily pulled into what's going on in the news cycle, anxiety, and are just focusing on our situations over our God who is control. And so often we just think, I just need a vacation. I just, I just need a loan. I just, I need to get away. And, and I'm all for that. Like, go get that Caribbean vacation, right? Like, I'm, I'm all for that. But more, more than we need that, we need to take care of our souls. We need rest for our souls. And see, soul care is the greatest form of self-care that there is. It is so much more important that we are taking care of our souls. And I wanted to share this post from Beverly. She's here from Beverly Bauma because this is just... This is just the epitome of, you know, we all think, I just, I need some more time. I need this if I just had this. And just, she just knocks out of the park. And she says, self-care tip, read your Bible. She goes, this, this is the honest truth. As a single working mom of five with little to no help, a full-time student at university, 
full-time taxi mom to sporting events and kid activities person, appointment scheduler, house tidier, grocery getter, food preparer, laundromat keeper, there is little time for self-care. In fact, I'd say it's pretty non-existent. Except, I seize 45 minutes every morning at 5 a.m. to read my Bible. It's the most sacred time of the day in that place of worship and surrender. On my little couch, in the corner of my living room, under my little lamp is where my cup is filled, my spirit renewed, my joy restored, strength given, fear disarmed, wisdom transferred, and heart healed. The faithfulness and love of God to see me through every moment of life brings tears to my eyes every single time. He's so good. And I cry because I know what Beverly's been through. And as a mom, I don't know what it's like to be a single mom. And my heart goes out to single moms. And I see a woman who puts God first and who gets rest for her soul. It's rest for her soul. That is the greatest rest. And Jesus gives it to us amidst just the crazy life. The hard truth is we might not get that me time. We might not get that Caribbean vacation. But we can have rest for our souls. God meets us where we are at. So come to him. He will give you rest Make it a habit of just going to him before you run to your phone, before you call a friend, before you run to a drink or, or to Netflix, because he can give you the rest that we need. So we are created in the image of God to reflect and represent him on this earth. So let's reflect him in our worth knowing that our past has been redeemed, knowing that our future sins have been redeemed, that he accepts us, that he loves us, that he's given us a new nature to follow him. Let's reflect him in our purpose, knowing that our purpose is to reign and rule under him and that we do that as we live like Christ. And let's reflect him in our rest as we find our worth and our purpose in him. And as we do this, we're going to be women who are just full of peace, who are full of security, who are full of assurance and joy. And we are going to have a God confidence, a God confidence that is going to attract others to the one true God. So we're going to close and we are going to, if you can just stand up with me, we're going to sing. We're going to sing How Great Thou Art. And I love this song. Growing up, my grandpa was always singing this song, so it just brings back so many memories. But I love how you're going to see it begins with creation, and it ends in new creation. And it talks about what God has done to redeem us and to give us true rest. When I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the Yeah.
to know you, to serve you, to reign and rule under you, to bring your kingdom, God. I just pray that as we go out today, tonight, Lord, that they would know their worth and that they would reflect that. Oh, that the world would look at them and see something different, that they would just see your presence and your goodness. God, that they would know that they're, they're created to lay down their lives for your glory, God. So help us to do that. Show us how and where to do that, Lord. And above all, God, I just pray that you would give them rest. Rest in who you are. Rest for their souls. Rest from anxious thoughts. Rest from depression. Rest from addiction, God. Just break it off of them in the name of Jesus. We just praise you. We love you. Thank you, God, that you created us in your image and that you made us the pinnacle of your creation. It is beyond, it is beyond my, what I can fathom, God. You are so good. You are so amazing. You are great and amazing, and we love you. In your name I pray, amen.